My name is Sanjay Gupta and I am a cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of heart failure and in particular on a special type of pacemaker which can make a significant improvement to the quality of life and length of life in patients with heart failure. What is heart failure? The heart is a pump and if the heart in some way becomes damaged, be that by a heart attack or a virus or harmful drugs, then the heart is unable to pump out enough blood to meet the body's requirements, especially when the body is asking for more blood, such as during exercise. This inadequacy of the heart is often manifested with symptoms of breathlessness, fatigue and exercise intolerance, and this is termed heart failure. Virtually all forms of heart disease, if progressive and if left unchecked, will eventually end up with the heart weakening and thereby the patient developing heart failure. Patients with heart failure in general will not live as long as they would have if they had a strong heart and in general they do not feel as good as they would if they had a strong heart and therefore heart failure negatively impacts on both length of life and quality of life. It is also important to understand that heart failure if left untreated is a progressive condition and I will try and explain how this happens. When the heart pumps less blood out, our kidneys receive less blood than they expect and they therefore act almost as if one were dehydrated. They start retaining more salt and water in order to boost the circulatory volume because they're getting less blood so they want to have more volume so that they can get more blood. However, the problem is not the we are lacking volume in heart failure, it is just that the volume is not getting to the kidneys because the pump is weak and therefore by increasing the volume the kidneys will still not get the blood that they expect and therefore they continue to increase retention of salt and water and slowly and gradually the amount of volume in the vascular system and the amount of blood entering the heart progressively increases and the heart which has to contain all this blood starts stretching and in doing so, it becomes weaker and flabbier. So the aim, therefore, in the management of heart failure is to try and firstly improve the patient's quality of life by relieving symptoms, but also to try and prolong their life by giving them those medications that reduce the progression of heart failure. And we do now have some really good medications that help do both. And these medications include ACE inhibitors. And now instead of ACE inhibitors, people are using a medication called Entresto, beta blockers. There's another category of medication called MRAs, mineraloreceptor antagonists. And finally, there are the new agents, the new anti-diabetic agents called the SGLT2 inhibitors. And all of these medications can prolong life in heart failure. And ideally, therefore, anyone with heart failure should be on all these medications unless they're intolerant or in some way the medications are contraindicated in that patient. Nevertheless, despite all these medications, a substantial proportion of heart failure patients remain significantly symptomatic and mortality remains high. And this is where cardiac resynchronization therapy, the topic of today's talk, has proved to be a game changer. What we have realized is that as the heart gets weaker, it also gets bigger and flabbier. It gets bigger because it has to contain all this blood and as a consequence, it becomes flabby. And therefore, electrical impulses will take longer to get to some parts of the heart, usually the free wall of the left ventricle, compared to other parts of the heart. And this means that some walls of the heart receive their electrical impulses earlier and therefore contract earlier than other parts of the heart, and this is referred to as cardiac dyssynchrony. The way I like to explain cardiac dyssynchrony is to think of a sack of potatoes. If you want to empty a sack of potatoes most efficiently, you would want to hold the bottom of the sack at both ends and then tip it over. If you only held one end, one corner, then some potatoes would fall to the other side rather than fall out of the sack. This is very similar to what happens with blood when it comes out of the heart. The heart will always function more effectively if all the walls contract in synchrony. And therefore, the greater the cardiac dyssynchrony, the more inefficient the heart becomes. 
How do we know if there's cardiac dyssynchrony? The easiest way is to look at the ECG. On the ECG, we have a, a complex known as the QRS complex with each heartbeat, and the duration of the QRS complex guides us on how long it has taken for the electrical impulses to go around the ventricle. The longer the QRS duration, the more the dyssynchrony, especially if the QRS is in a pattern called left bundle branch block. The usual duration of the QRS is less than 120 milliseconds. If on the ECG the QRS is more than 120 milliseconds, then there is some evidence of dyssynchrony. And if it is more than 150 milliseconds, then there is a lot of dyssynchrony. In advanced heart failure, we know that the longer the QRS, the longer the duration of the QRS, the poorer the prognosis. And therefore, scientists became very interested in exploring ways to reduce this dyssynchrony. This led to the development of a special type of pacemaker called a biventricular pacemaker, which basically involved putting a lead, an electrical lead in the right ventricle, and one in a vessel called the coronary sinus, which overlies the left ventricle. This then allows the pacemaker to deliver electrical impulses to the ventricles in synchrony, and therefore allow for a more effective contraction of the heart. Now, in 2002, a study called Miracle was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in which 453 patients with moderate to severe heart failure, uh, ejection fractions of less than 35%, and normal ejection fraction is 60%, so these guys had hearts which were working at around about half of what is normal, and a QRS of greater than 130 milliseconds, so a QRS which was wide, which was suggestive of dyssynchrony, these were the patients that were studied. 228 out of these 453 patients were randomized to receive conventional medicational therapy and a biventricular pacemaker, and 225 patients were just given conventional therapies and no biventricular pacemaker. And the results showed that the patients who had received the biventricular pacemaker had a much more marked improvement in their functional capacity. They were able to walk for longer distances and they even noticed an improvement in the ejection fraction. In addition, the group with the biventricular pacemaker were less likely to be hospitalized for heart failure flare-ups. So on the basis of these data, there was little doubt that biventricular pacing could be a useful adjunct to conventional therapy in terms of improving quality of life in patients with significant heart failure and ECG evidence of dyssynchrony. But the question was, could it also make us live longer? Could it make those patients live longer? Could it improve their prognosis? And then came along a study called Companion, which was published, I think, in 2004. And in this study, the investigators took 1,520 patients with advanced heart failure and a QRS duration of greater than 120 milliseconds, and then randomized them to one of three groups. So the first group were just asked to take their usual medications. The second group were given a biventricular pacemaker in addition to their usual medications. And the third group were given a biventricular pacemaker, which was then combined in the same device with a defibrillator. And they found that the risk of the combined endpoint of death from, hospital death from hospitalization for heart failure was reduced by 34% in the biventricular group and 40% in the biventricular defibrillator group compared to the patients who just took the medications. And then there was another study called CARE-HF, which looked at 813 patients and found that in patients with heart failure and cardiac dyssynchrony, cardiac resynchronization, a biventricular pacemaker, improved symptoms and quality of life and reduced complications and the risk of death. And on the basis of all these data, all patients who have significant heart failure, who have evidence of dyssynchrony on their ECG as measured by a wide QRS of greater than 120 milliseconds should be considered for a biventricular device, especially if they are symptomatic despite medical therapy. There are some important points to note. Only seven out of 10 people who receive a biventricular device actually feel the benefits of it. And scientists are still trying very hard to see whether we can be more sophisticated about identifying those people who are going to respond positively to the biventricular pacemaker and those who will not before they put in the pacemaker. Because at this current time, 
three out of 10 people get the biventricular pacemaker but don't notice a benefit from it. Maybe the biventricular pacemaker still potentially stops them from dying, uh, but they don't notice a significant improvement in their quality of life. Uh, the, the other thing to say is patients in whom the cause of the heart failure is a previous heart attack seem to benefit more than patients in whom the heart failure has been caused by some other etiology, like a virus or a familial cardiomyopathy. Uh, and that's probably because in patients with heart disease, with, with a heart attack, you've already got an area which is not moving. So you've already got evidence of more dyssynchrony, I think. Um, another thing to mention is that it is patients with a left bundle branch block pattern on the ECG who seem to benefit more. And the longer the QRS, the worse the prognosis and the more likely that patient is to benefit from the device. So, you know, the longer the QRS, the worse the prognosis, and therefore those are the people who really benefit. It is also important to mention that even if you don't have ECG evidence of left bundle branch block or a wide QRS on your ECG now, it can develop with time. And therefore, even though you may not be suitable now for a biventricular pacemaker, as time progresses, you may be. And in one study, it was found that one in 10 patients will develop left bundle branch block in the first year of follow-up, meaning that you may not have it, but one out of 10 people will then be eligible for it after one year. And therefore, it is always a good idea if you have heart failure to have a 12 lead ECG at least once every year, because it is possible that you may be eligible for a biventricular pacemaker, which could in turn have a significant impact on quality of life and length of life. So the main message here is that there may be a bunch of people who have heart failure, who are still symptomatic, who are still taking medications, and who are still desperate for some relief. And in those people, get an ECG done. If you have a left bundle branch block pattern, if your QRS is prolonged greater than 120 milliseconds, see your cardiologist and see if they would consider you for a biventricular pacemaker. So I hope you found this useful. I'm so sorry I haven't been able to do any videos for the past few weeks. I'd actually been away for a while to spend some time with my mother as it was coming up to a year since my father passed away. And uh, since I got back, I've just been struggling with the backlog of work. Uh, but I'm slowly rediscovering my mojo. So hopefully uh, there'll be more, I'll be more regular with my videos. Thank you so much for your patience and I value each and every one of you. Thank you so much.